Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. The origin of Neolithic culture in Britain is a highly debated era of history, the time when agriculture was first introduced to the British Isles. No archaeological site has given a clear picture of the Mesolithic to Neolithic transition period. There are no complete or robust stratigraphic sequences that cover the period, and we don't really see a continual use of sites through the transition. This observation points to Britain being colonised sometime after 4000 BC, and DNA evidence seems to confirm incoming people at this time, with 20% of the population arriving from abroad. There are broadly similar examples of monuments and artefacts in Europe compared to those that appeared in Britain during the early Neolithic, but there isn't a clear source for the colonisers. We don't know for sure where they came from. Of course, an abrupt change of culture isn't proof of the arrival of new people, and we know that Mesolithic Britain was in contact with the continent before agriculture arrived on these shores. But even though there is DNA evidence, people still believe that the Mesolithic people of Britain developed agriculture when the conditions were right, which isn't beyond human capabilities at all. Not everybody wants to think that outsiders brought more advanced forms of civilization to Britain, and they ask why people would leave the continent for Britain when there are no known problems with agriculture elsewhere. Why would people up sticks and move across the channel for no obvious reason? It just isn't logical. That being said, the appearance of new giant structures in the early Neolithic, such as cursus monuments, long barrows and causeways enclosures, is surely enough evidence to point to colonisation. These were not crude constructions from hunter-gatherers, but tried and tested architectural structures well planned and well constructed. When we look at them more closely, they clearly display architectural knowledge in their construction, and they are a huge leap from the British Mesolithic society. Although agriculture didn't reach every part of the British Isles in the early Neolithic, the cultural change was certainly widespread, and reached from southern England to Scotland in just decades. Yes, only 20% of the British population were settlers at this time, but if one of the population estimates of 100,000 at 4000 BC is correct, that means that a 20,000 strong invading civilization would have come to Britain, which is certainly enough to implement the scale of social changes that we see. The Neolithic period offers both continuities and contrasts with what came before it, but there was now animal herding, cereal cultivation and woodland clearances, as well as the construction of long barrows, cursus monuments and causeways enclosures. Of course, the archaeological record for the Mesolithic to Neolithic transition is far from complete, and there is a bias in terms of the sites excavated and surveyed, as well as the bias in preservation due to ground conditions and soil types. The early Neolithic people did know how to effectively shape the landscape for purpose, and this suggests that the Mesolithic to Neolithic transition was far more revolutionary than it was evolutionary. Not only do we see structured farming practices, such as land preparation and deforestation, but we also see the erection of large timber dwellings. Flint mining operations were massively expanded. We see the first British-made pottery, and we also see the stone grinding and polishing techniques to make symmetrical axe heads. On top of everything else, we see the onset of major monument building, where hundreds of thousands of worker hours would have been expended in their construction. Did the Mesolithic hunter-gatherers really assemble themselves in such a strategic way? Or did colonisers, with a more advanced knowledge, direct the vast amount of changes we see in Neolithic Britain? I think the two schools of thought work together. I think the Mesolithic people certainly adapted themselves and changed to agriculture, but I also think that somebody came to show them the way. And my question is, where did they come from? British culture certainly changed, and although DNA evidence shows that there was an outside influence, the indigenous population would have had to adopt this change. The amount of labour needed for the construction projects alone shows that there would have had to have been a high degree of social cohesion, and also a belief in the work that they were doing. The evidence certainly suggests that Britain was colonised, but the origin of the new settlers is puzzling, even for the hardline colonisation supporters especially when one of the main building projects, 
Cursus monuments are not found in the archaeological record outside of the British Isles. Yes, there are a handful of possible precursors on the continent that have been identified, but these were functionally different monuments in my opinion, and the huge quantity found in Britain is itself unusual. So, people arrived, but we don't know where from, and why would so many people leave their homeland to venture into the unknown to build a new society from scratch elsewhere? Well, in Britain, at the time, climate was fluctuating, with temperature ranges increasing, giving rise to warmer summers and colder winters. There was also a reduction in winter rainfall, as the late Mesolithic wet period was coming to an end. All this meant was that Britain was prime land for cereal growth, as the suitable growing season was somewhat lengthened. But did possibly thousands of migrants enter Britain for its potentially good harvests? There would be so much energy expended in landscape preparation to get them into a position to be able to farm, not to mention the potential dangers of backlash from the indigenous Britons. Conditions on the continent were not in decline, so a large migration of people from northern Europe seems impractical and unlikely. So how can we explain it? Well, there was a landmass that time has forgotten, that was close enough to successfully transport vast amounts of people, their technologies and their supplies to not just Britain, but to other parts of northern Europe as well. The Neolithic arrived in Britain at roughly the same time as it arrived in Scandinavia, and I don't think this is a coincidence. After researching the possible locations, there is just one potential origin. A land that was once situated between Britain and Scandinavia, but is now drowned beneath the North Sea. The last surviving part of Doggerland, known as Dogger Bank. The landmass fascinates historians, archaeologists and researchers, because so little is known about it. Some have even speculated it's the location of the lost city of Atlantis. A lot of the information we have about Doggerland has come from geophysical surveys from oil companies, which have revealed a flat, but certainly not featureless, expanse of land. There were thousands of kilometres of cross-cutting river channels, small islands, and at its heart was a huge natural lake, into which the rivers would have flowed. It was a vast European delta, the size of Germany, and from plant remains found in the North Sea sediments, Doggerland would have been one of the most lush and fertile places on Earth. In the rivers there were reed beds, there were large expanses of deciduous woodland with hazel, oak and elm trees. The landscape would have been full of natural resources to encourage the migration of animals, and archaeologists have found evidence for a rich biodiversity. In the past half a million years, there is evidence of all kinds of exotic creatures, including woolly mammoths, spotted hyenas, giant hippos, giant elephants, lions, giant deer, rhinos, and the enigmatic saber-toothed tiger. Most would have lived alongside humans, as there is evidence of butchered rhinos, human remains, and hand axes, all within the same sedimentary lair. In fact, there is evidence of human occupation on Doggerland for tens of thousands of years. Just 10 to 12,000 years ago, the time when Gebekli Tepe appeared from nowhere, archaeologists estimate that more than 100,000 people could have lived there. As the sea level rose at the end of the last ice age, the rich and fertile Doggerland slowly became flooded as a shallow sea emerged that surrounded the huge expanse of rolling hills. Year by year the sea level continued to rise, a gradual evolution of the landscape, but at 6200 BC all this would change. Geologists have discovered that the land was hit by an enormous natural disaster that would leave nothing but death and destruction in its path. A mega tsunami, known today as the Sturega Slide, produced waves of up to 20 metres high, and it not only battered Doggerland, but the north and eastern coasts of Britain as well. A submarine landslide off the coast of Norway caused the monstrous surge, and evidence for its occurrence is widespread. The best location is the Montrose Basin on Scotland's east coast, where a coarse layer of sandy sediment is sandwiched by the usual silt and clay deposits. Inside are bashed and broken marine organisms called diatoms, 
which clearly encountered a lot of force and energy before their deposition. Due to the size of the wave and the general flat surface topography of Doggerland, the Sturega slide would have caused a monumental loss of human life, with far more displaced in its aftermath. After Sturega, Britain was certainly an island nation, and although the tsunami floodwaters receded, Doggerland continued to shrink under the waves. It is thought that the last piece of Doggerland, known as Dogger Bank, disappeared around this time. The dates arise from recorded average levels of the world's oceans, rising approximately 100 metres since 14,000 BC, due to the influx of glacial meltwater. 6,000 BC was when the present global ocean sea level was attained, and although this level has exceeded by 3 or 4 metres around 4,000 BC, a series of oscillations brought it down once again. But one problem that many researchers haven't taken into account is that in 6000 BC, the North Sea shoreline in Holland was actually 19 metres lower than it is today, inferring that the seawater wasn't as deep above Doggerland. Even today, the shallowest point is a mere 15 metres below the surface, which means that at 6000 BC, parts of Doggerland were still above ground. So how could this be? Well, when ice caps form, their vast weight depresses the land and forces neighbouring areas to bulge upwards. When the ice melts, the process is reversed. The areas that were covered by ice slowly begin to rise back to their normal levels, as is still happening today in Scotland, and the land that neighboured the ice begins to sink. This is known as isostatic rebound. Doggerland was part of a land bulge during the last ice age, and as the ice melted, not only did it have an influx of water, but the land also began to sink, which means Doggerland, and hence Dogger Bank, was once substantially higher than it is today. The 19 metre anomaly in Holland is due to ground subsidence. Back in 1995, Professor Kurt Lambeck from the Research School of Earth Sciences at the Australian National University released a paper of glacial hydro-isostatic rebound models of the North Sea and the British Isles, in which he modelled the disappearance of Doggerland. He notes that in 6000 BC, Britain was still connected to the continent, but a thousand years later, around 5000 BC, the southern North Sea became fully marine and connected to the English Channel. In his diagram, all that remained of Doggerland was the steep-sided high ground of Dogger Bank. More recent scientific modelling, thanks to the study of mollusk sequences in sediment, shows that it may not have been until around 3800 BC with an increased tidal range that the Anglo-European land bridge was finally closed, which also has implications for the last remaining parts of Doggerland. A growing number of scientists agree that during the 5th millennium BC, Dogger Bank was still an island, and there may well have been lesser islands between East Anglia and Dogger Bank for quite some time. Today, Dogger Bank is just 15 metres below sea level, which makes it scientifically feasible that it was still above ground at the start of the British and Scandinavian Neolithic. We know from finds dredged by trawlers, borehole analysis, and sonar mapping that Doggerland was once a Mesolithic paradise a rich and fertile land that would have been a real-life Garden of Eden, the most idyllic location to settle in northern Europe, an area that was certainly populated and where ideas and practices would have no doubt been shared and subsequently developed for thousands of years after the last ice age. As the land got smaller and smaller, the plain of Dogger Bank would have been the last surviving part of the once populous North European landmass. And Dogger Bank was no tiny island. It was 17,600 square kilometres in size, was relatively flat and located just 100 kilometres off the coast of England. As the large landmass of Doggerland began to shrink under the rising post-glacial seas, populations would have either migrated inwards or left the landmass for pastures new. It is very likely that a relatively large population remained on Dogger Bank, but at some time, most likely at the end of the British Mesolithic, it would have had to have been evacuated. Hundreds, if not thousands of people, would have had to leave their home behind and rebuild their civilization. 
And where were the closest destinations? Britain, Scandinavia and parts of Northern Europe. The same places where society became Neolithic at roughly the same time as Dogger Bank became lost under the waves. Coincidence? Archaeological evidence for the origins of Britain's new Neolithic civilization is very limited, but scholars suggest they belong to groups from northeast France, Belgium and southern Netherlands, where Neolithic cultures were already established. Of course, this is possible, but the incoming people clearly had some form of central organisation and followed a uniform plan for populating and shaping Britain. Unless there were serious agricultural difficulties in Northern Europe around 4000 BC, it is hard to understand why such large groups of people would go to so much effort to start again, to set up new practices in a foreign land when they had already established themselves on the continent. For all we know, Doggerland could well have been the birthplace of all European Neolithic practices, seeding the Northern European communities in the years before their arrival in Britain, hence the similarities in archaeology. It could well have been the home of the builders of Gebekli Tepe, who took agriculture to Turkey after the last ice age, as sea levels began to rise. We just don't know, but it's certainly possible. The huge social economic changes in Britain the relative speed of transition to agriculture, the craftsmanship of the new monuments and the clear organisation points to mass migration of a multi-skilled, more advanced people and as we cannot pinpoint an area on the continent where they came from, Doggerland seems to be their most likely origin. As it is now sunken beneath the waves, we simply do not know enough about its history to build a more robust case. But, from archaeological finds brought up by fishing trawlers, we know that humans occupied the land for thousands of years after the last ice age, and due to the similarities in artefacts, they certainly had contact with their northern European neighbours. It would have been an almighty task to get people and their resources to Britain. The incoming people would have had to have had an array of maritime skills, which is what you would expect from the survivors of Doggerland who were likely to have established trading routes with northern European communities when they were an island nation in the late Mesolithic. I must also mention that there is evidence to suggest that there was also a secondary, lesser influx of people into Western Britain and Ireland too, who were likely to have come from another locality, certainly in Europe, and probably travelling along the established Mesolithic Atlantic routes to reach their destination. This is thought to be the case due to the distinctive portal tombs and passage graves that we see in western localities and are characteristically different from the main early Neolithic structures such as cursus monuments, causeways enclosures and long barrows that we mainly see in the east. I certainly believe that Doggerland is the most likely origin for the ancient Neolithic British and Scandinavian cultures and I believe that in time we may find out that it was in fact the birthplace of European civilization. Thank you for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. Please like the video, please subscribe to the channel, and please share this across your social networks. Thank you.